Welcome to everybody, and I'm thrilled to see this great turnout tonight for this really important step in the process towards our Sanford High School and Technical Center. And this is the, one of the many steps towards our um, high school and technical center that we're hoping to be have open by the fall of 2018. Um, one thing that has come up a few times, I want to answer one question, is why another straw poll? Um, as you know, many of you were here last year at this time, this same week in June, and uh, that straw poll was to really determine and to gauge support for pursuing the recommended site and, spent, and investing in the site studies that needed to be done. Uh, now here we are a year later, the uh, studies have been completed, and uh, we also, there um, also has been a price negotiated on the land. So tonight what we're here for with this straw poll is to again um, gauge and hopefully you all agree that we should continue with this site. Um, because I see a lot of uh, folks in the audience that I believe have uh, young families. We've made a commitment to people to try to keep this going smoothly and to have the straw poll exactly at 6.30 so that people can get home for part two of their day. Uh, so here's how we're going to uh, do the schedule. Uh, first, we're going to have our folks from the um, from Spago Technics and our um, architect from La Valley Bresigner and our city manager uh, lead you through uh, what the process has been so far and uh, the information that's been gleaned through that process. You'll also uh, be hearing about um, the financial investment that needs to be made. Um, from there, there's going to be a very, very brief, so we can stay on time, question and answer period. And we are going to do the poll at exactly 6.30. Immediately following the poll, uh, architect Lance, um, I always want to call you Lance, no, Lance Armstrong, no, I know you're not, Lance Whitehead, um, is going to uh, give a demonstration. He is going to um, do a 3D presentation of where the exterior and interior uh, design is at this point. He's going to lead you through that and we're going to ask everyone to hold their questions and comments till after so the people that can stay until 7 o'clock are able to see the whole thing. After 7 o'clock there will be ample time for questions and comments. So right now I'm going to turn it over to our city manager Steve Buck. Thank you Kendra. Okay, so you can see in these slides for the first time tonight, so am I, so, so bear with me. Um, here we go. So we're currently uh, involved in a 21 step that's mandated by the State of Maine Department of Education. We're currently at step six. So if I had the, the chart here tonight, we, you'd see we're only at step six of 21 steps, which is the review and approval of the site. We're going to have a subsequent meeting to this that will talk to you about the building design and we'll have a separate straw poll just on the building design. Um, so, so currently the plan remains flexible uh, as far as what we've been working on to date and other milestones we've, we've had to date. We have approved the site size and number of education areas, the supporting offices, building core areas and the total area funded by the Department of Education. That's been accomplished. Uh, we're going to speak to you extensively tonight about the site that we're moving forward on, uh, what the acquisition costs are, what the findings have been, what the process has been. Um, we'll later come to you with a straw poll as far as the overall building concept, the overall site concept, and the construction cost. Uh, and it's at that next straw poll that we'll get into what is the state cost as far as the overall design as well as the local cost, and we'll talk to you about impacts to taxation. Um, I'm going to ask David to come up here in just a moment and talk to you about the educational uh, uh, programming aspects, but uh, milestones to date, we've, we've uh, adopted and reviewed the educational specs and programming that's been completed. We're doing the straw poll tonight on just the site. We're going to give you those details. Uh, site approval is now pushed forward to August of, of this year where, where we'll go before the state 
uh, construction committee of the Department of Education will go before that committee, review the, uh, the site and the concept with them. We'll then move forward um, in early September uh, for State Department of Education approval of the overall concept of the site. And then we'll move forward in the public educational campaign from that point forward, as well as do a second straw poll here on the design, and we'll take that forward for a public referendum proposed for December 2014. And it was at that public referendum that will be a binding vote by the community. Our design firm will then uh, initiate design and engineering to be completed October or November of 2015, bid the project out that winter and go to construction uh, that following spring, and we are proposing to occupy the facility by the summer of 2018. At this point in time, I'd ask David to come up and talk to you about the uh, programming milestones that have been accomplished to date. Thanks, Steve. How come I'm the only one with a jacket on tonight here? <laughs> Something's not right. Uh, the Ed Specs was, were the first uh, step that we went forward with, and basically we were trying to remodel education a bit, and I want to bring this one forward. What we were trying to do was to find a way that we could bring the technical center and the high school a little closer together to get the two programs to uh, work closer together and also enhance each other. So what you can see, uh, based on what we did was we developed four pathways or four clusterings of the technical center courses, and basically it would be we took uh, uh, building uh, trades, we took welding, we took precision manufacturing, all those ones that were related, and we put them all into one wing. We took another wing and put other related courses together. And in that, we integrated different uh, high school courses, such as English, math, science, and so forth. So that's the basic concept of the four pathways. We're after these smaller learning communities. They were So that's why we had four wings. There were basically four smaller schools within the bigger school. Uh, we had Our design was to have academic classes oriented uh, towards the technical school program to be able to uh, support them. And uh, we're also hoping is that we will have freshmen in each of those wings so that they can say, you know what, I'm really interested in the science and technology area. I'd like to be in this wing for my four years, perhaps, and that would be their pathway. So our goal, of course, is that we have students that are career and college ready and that, uh, that all students graduate with a diploma and with the cl class of 2018, that's where the new state diploma requirements come forward. So uh, next picture, just a, a little design on this, and I'll hand it back to Steve. This is an example of some of the work that our architect did with the uh, folks in the technical center. Uh, I believe we're looking at welding and fabrication over on the right and computer-assisted drafting and drawing or drawing and drafting. Which way do I get it? Drafting and design. I wasn't even close on either one of them. Thanks, Jim. So on those two programs, what happened was the architect came in, talked with the uh, instructor of that program, said, what do you need for equipment? What do you need for area? And these are some of the initial designs that were going forward. And those are still being tweaked and so forth. As uh, Steve said, there's a lot of flexibility in the design. So with this, I'm going to turn it back to Steve, who's going to continue. Or is it Kylie? Or is it Lance? Okay. I'll speak a little bit to this. Um, so overall, as, as Stephen noted, it is a fairly lengthy and arduous process with the state. Um, the takeaway here is that it is a state-run process, and it's something that we've worked closely with them. And I know um, we've been a long time coming between the straw polls, and there's been a little bit of lack of information out there. But if you look at the way this process develops, is is for us to create some designs and to review it with the state. Um, and if you look at each of these kind of rounds of processes, it always ends with a state review. That's really where we're at today, where you can see that our next steps are to continue to develop the program, to continue to develop the design, and to continue to develop to review that with the state so that we can show the community what the state has approved, what the community has for options, and we can go forward with a referendum um, so that you can gauge as to whether you support the project. Um, our big next steps here are continue to work with the state and to finalize many of the community options, which we'll talk about a little later in the evening. Um, overall, we have been working towards a public engagement plan. We know that a lot of people here um, care a lot about the school, care a lot about the tech center, and care a lot about what this building looks like, how it works, what their students are going to see from a day-to-day -day basis. Um, 
it is a state process. However, we're, there are some community options that are embedded in that process, and there are some community-funded options that we'll talk a little bit about later tonight, um, and they can include the auditorium. I, many of you are aware that we've gauged the communities, would you like an auditorium? Because that's something the state says, if you want that, that's a community-funded item. Would you like bleachers on your football field? Again, option for you community funded item the state does not support that so there's been a fair amount of feedback back and forth with the community you can see on the bottom half the community dates uh, the community sessions we've had to date although there's been a lull of about a year in this process actually lull's been about four months in this process um, we're going to continue to engage the community as much as we can to gauge what would you like the building to look like what would you like the building to feel like what would you like to add to the state funded process um, how do you see tweaking this to make sure it is an inherently Sanford and Technical Center project. And with that, we're going to jump right into site selection to keep ourselves on track. And I'm going to turn it over to Kylie Mason. Hi there. Um, we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to be really quick. So just to update again on where we started, we started with a little over 118 sites. I think um, we had eight come forward from citizens and the community that gave us 126. And, and this flow chart kind of outlines how those sites were evaluated and then ultimately uh, winnowed down to the three that we were looking at. So this is what the 126 look like. Um, so you can see the, the spread throughout the community. Here's the three that were the finalists. Um, you can see the environmental comparison that we had done at the last straw poll. Um, this is site three. This is the one we had focused on after the straw poll, and it's actually made up of uh, two primary parcels, and then um, we've been working with the Mouse and Way Land Trust for some additional areas. Uh, so we have the townhouse parcels, which is roughly 40 acres. I'm sorry, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Um, no, I'm sorry. 50.1. Uh, Great Works is 77, and then the Mouse and Way Land Trust is around 2. Um, this is just a conceptual plan layout, um, how we've been thinking about how the building will fit on the site. Uh, athletic field, so um, this will be probably difficult for you to see towards the back, but football field, softball field to the right of the building, to the right of the parking lot. Tennis courts um, are just below the, f the football field. Multi-purpose field um, closest to Main Street. Baseball field um, kind of nestled in the crook of the road arriving into the site. And multi-purpose fields just to the right of the entrance drive. Um, there are additional parcels that we haven't really explored for you know, community fields or additional green space. But this does show the basic program with some some expansion areas that won't necessarily be part of the final package. Um, this is just a handy bird's eye view from our architect. He's got something way better later on. But you can start to get an idea of how everything lays out on the site, how it relates to Main Street, um, and how it might look if you were flying over it. So from a former slide that we had before you, I'm going to back up to that for just, just a moment. We've been dealing with uh, three property owners. We, we've been dealing with Great Works Realty, LLC, Townhouse Properties, and Sanford Springfield Malsam Way Land Trust, and those are labeled on this particular diagram. Um, the Great Works parcels total 77 acres. We were able to negotiate a purchase of, those, of that acreage at the city's assessed value. Townhouse properties totals 50.1 acres, and we're also able to negotiate and purchase that land for the city's assessed value. The Mouse Way Land Trust is going to convey to the city two acres, which you see outlined in red, as well as the right-of-way off on Route 4, which is the old trolley bed that will allow for the dual access points required by the states. We'll have access off on Route 4, uh, immediately adjacent to Jagger Mill Road, and we'll also have access on 109 Main Street, immediately adjacent to Old Mill Road. Uh, in exchange for the two acres being conveyed to the city by the Muslim Way Land Trust, we will convey to the uh, trust seven acres of high-valued uh, wading bird habitat, for, for, which is on the northeast corner of, of the Great Works parcel. You can see there's a, there's a darker area up in that northeast corner. Uh, again, that's high-valued wading bird habitat. 
The Muslim Way Land Trust would like to have access to that and, pre and preserve it. Uh, we will also be constructing a gravel parking lot, which is, will serve a dual function of, for one of our softball fields, as well as provide a trailhead access for the Mouse Way Land Trust in conjunction with the city's trail, uh, trail association, uh, trails committee, to, to build further trails. So the total school site, as you see proposed here, is 127.1 acres. Uh, the total purchase price of that is $696,920, which is the city's assessed value for the combined acreage. The state will purchase 49 acres and contribute $90,593 to the, uh, the purchase of the overall site. And the city will purchase the remaining 78.1 acres and contribute $606,327. So in this part of the process, the city is bearing the majority of the cost as far as the overall cost for site acquisition. When we get to school construction, that relationship is actually in the inverse. The state will bear the overall burden of cost for the construction of the actual design that's being proposed, and the city will, will support the lesser cost of that. And we'll get into that for the next straw poll. So do you want me to to take the question at this point or, or ask, ask for questions? Okay, so at this point in time, we'll ask for questions for the public. How are we doing for time? We've got five minutes for questions. Okay, about nine minutes. We're doing better on time. Uh, when we get to the point of, of answering the questions at 6.30, the straw poll vote that we will do, we will do is before you now. It says, do you continue to support the proposed site as originally recommended and as further studied for the purpose of construction of a new Sanford High School and Sanford Regional Technical Center. And at that time, we'll ask you for a show of hands and we'll poll the audience. So questions from the audience at this point in time? I know it's been a lot of information very rapidly. Yes, sir. My question would be, how much of that land is actually buildable land at this point? And uh, what kind of a flood zone is that in, being right on the river? Hi there. Uh, we don't have a slide in here. Um, some of the additional parcels, let me just back up. Uh, the, the part that we're looking at for the school uh, is roughly 69 acres, a little bit excess of that. Um, yeah, it's all pretty much buildable land. I mean, no, that's not all of the buildable land. That's all that we're developing is about 69 acres. Those are vernal pools. Right. Well, the area around the vernal pools is never going to be a buildable area, correct? Um, it's not never developable. It's just something you have to negotiate with the state and. And as far as the floodplain goes, uh, there's the no floodplain flood in this area. There is uh, some floodplain with the wading bird habitat, but again, that's area we weren't planning on developing for the conveyance. River, river's never going to get out there. It's fully insurable as far as flood insurance. Right. It's not within a FEMA flood zone. Okay. A few months ago, um, I remember that there was 70 or 90 acres that you were going to use. Now it's 127. What happened to those extra acres? And I'm assuming some of them are for athletic fields that the state probably won't pay for. So why can't, instead of the town paying $600,000 up front, buy some of that land in the future as they need it for the athletic fields? So we're dealing with three property owners. That you see there, Great Works Parcels, uh, Great Works Realty LLC is, is predominantly in, is the shape in the yellow. Uh, there was 77 acres contiguous, and as, as you can remember, as the school sits on that, that, that occupies uh, the majority of that 77 acres. Muslim Way Land Trust, that's, we're, we're doing swaps in that, so there's no money that changed hands there. The townhouse parcels, as you see outlined in blue, uh, the project needed a uh, portion of that. Uh, the, the landowners in question townhouse parcels were not interested in separating those parcels because uh, the project would predominantly remove the road frontage 
and make the rear acreage extremely difficult for them to, to further develop. Therefore, they, they, the negotiations resulted in they wanted to convey their entire parcel and not portions thereof. Uh, but that does give the city a, a significant amount of future expansion area there for school purposes, for recreational purposes, and for the trail systems. Immediately to the west of the townhouse parcels, uh, to the left-hand side of the slide as you look at that, the city also has 40 contiguous acres there on both sides of the Mousam River. That land that the city has, the 40 acres, is predominantly wetland areas um, and is not prime developable space by any stretch of the imagination, but it does allow for the, the Trails Committee to continue their trails network from our downtown all the way through to the high school site. How is it figured how much the state will pay towards the land and how much the city has to pay towards the land? The state will pay the averaged appraised value uh, for the parcels in question. And so there were two appraisals that were done and uh, produced the average per, per acre cost of the appraisals. Um, and then the city has to pick up the remaining value of that. So the state's going to purchase the 49 acres based upon the average appraised value. That's the $90,000 determination. The city picks up the remainder of that for which we negotiated that for the city's assessed value. Steve, I might just add on that the state has a formula for how many acres that they'll actually participate in, and that's based on the enrollment of the high school and half the technical center, and why half? Because only half the students are there at the technical center at any time, so they have a per acre calculation that they do. And uh, we wish it would have been more than 49, but 49 acres is what they're willing to participate in. So placing the school in the back here, it's going to drastically increase the traffic in that area during the mornings and evenings with school buses. Have we looked at the traffic redesign and who's going to pay for new lights and in increased sidewalks? There has been an MDOT, Maine Department of Transportation, tra traffic movement permit submitted, um, and those determinations have been made. MDOT has determined that there will be no need for traffic light in improvements at the, Jag the Route 4 intersection uh, opposite Jagger Mill, and they've made the same determination at the Route 109 intersection adjacent to Old Mill. So if 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 the Maine Department of Transportation, pursuant to that traffic movement permit, had made a determination that traffic improvements were necessary for this project, the project would have paid for those improvements. Any other questions? I'm just wondering, uh, I've heard that the deputy mayor owns some of the land that's being sold for this project, and she happens to be on the core uh, construction committee. Uh, since we're talking about the site selection, I'm wondering if that has had an influence on the selection of this site. And I'm curious about how much of the land is owned by the deputy mayor. Nope, let me answer it in this, this way. Here's, here's the slide. It's my understanding that the, the, the deputy mayor does have shares, share ownership, as in there's, there's uh, multiple ownerships for townhouse properties, and those are divvied up in shares. How many of those shares the deputy mayor has is, is unknown to me. The deputy mayor has not been participatory as far as the core building committee when it uh, has discussed anything to do with land acquisition. Uh, townhouse properties would be no different than any other property owner in the process in that if, if you owned one of these parcels, you would be fully appraised of what the uh, design process, site acquisition process is, all of the information pertaining to that. Um, and when I would, I was in charge of the land negotiations, so when I would come to you to negotiate, all of the information that would be known by a core building committee member would be known by you as the property owner. So you would be armed with that information. Um, as far as the negotiations on the parcels, uh, I dealt directly with the owners of Great Works LLC who then turned it over to an attorney and then we finished the process with, the, with their attorney. On townhouse properties, I dealt only with an attorney representing the multiple owners that comprise townhouse properties. So is, is, so is, that, is that sufficient or is there any, any other information I can give you? 
At, at a previous meeting, uh, I, I know I missed a few meetings, but I thought the MDOT was going to put a traffic light at Old Mill Road. Is that not going to happen now? That was one of the suppositions that we had. Uh, we did ask for consideration that they look at the traffic light that's at the Martins uh, parking lot intersection and potentially move that down to Old Mill. Uh, the turning movement study did not support the need for a light there, nor did the main Department of Transportation want to have two lights in that close proximity. The other element that we learned was that the if that light was removed from the Martins shopping center complex, uh, that light was paid for and is owned by that particular project. It would take away from the capacity that that, that uh, shopping facility currently has pursuant to that traffic light. So they had to do a turning movement study when that uh, development was put in place. They paid for that light. That stays with the project, as does that capacity. The turning movement study for this this development did not support further lighting. See, uh, in the in the past, they said there's so many accidents at Old Mill Road that the town wanted a traffic light there, and the state agreed that they should have one there. But now that's gone by the wayside, right? The the project, the turning movement for the project did not support a traffic light. But let me, but let me say, it, maybe, perhaps I can give you a greater comfort level. Uh, it's known to us that by 2016, the main Department of Transportation is looking at all of the lights on the Route 109 corridor. And we've been working with Steve Landry at the main Department of Transportation on that aspect. What happens at that particular time pursuant to that re-timing, re redesign, uh, lane improvements and such under that is not known to us yet. And they haven't even started the design process on that. But before the new high school is open, we will have a further opportunity to talk about traffic light improvements for the entire 109 corridor. They will be doing some transportation improvements adjacent to McDonald's this summer. They're going to mill that out, uh, repave it, and restripe it and put in a third turning lane to alleviate the problems that we have at the Emory, Emory Street intersection. So I'm being pointed at it is now 6.30. Uh, we have to conduct the straw poll at this point in time and then move forward for a further informational presentation. Uh, it's my understanding uh, people that are qualified to vote in this were giving cards on the way in this evening. Uh, so if you have a card, I would please ask you to uh, place your vote at this point in time. Um, so I would ask for an affirmative vote uh, to start. Do you, uh, so if you favor, do you continue to support the proposed site as originally recommended and as further studied for the purpose of construction of a new Sanford High School and Sanford Regional Technical Center? Would you please vote in the affirmative at this point in time? I have a card, I would vote yes, I do. Okay, all those opposed? Okay. Do we have the confirmation that we need? I believe that we do. Yeah, I'll, I'll allow that, and then we'll move into the next presentation. For myself, yeah, my name is Roland Cody, and I've talked to you for 25 years and stuff. I really feel that the vote tonight, I really don't have enough information. I'm very concerned about the amount of money that it's going to cost the local taxpayers. So I though I voted tonight to support the recommended for now, but I want people to know that I personally think we need to know a lot more information about what it's going to cost the local taxpayers and the construction of the building. So I hope this is not a vote that's going to be used to say we definitely are in favor of a new school. I'm in favor of a lot more information and then make a decision. Thank you. Excellent, excellent point. Um, one of the things that I'd like to kind of go through a little bit is the overall um, schedule. When we talk about milestones, um, one of the things that one of the few different milestones that are coming up is another straw poll to talk of, that will approve the design as well as the site design um, as well as the community funded items. Then eventually the referendum. The referendum is the point in which you will definitively decide how much money um, will come from the local tax rate. Um, we do have several meetings leading up to that. I would encourage people to come out, get educated, get involved, um, help us assess or help the core building committee, 
um, the school department, the city assess what is the right amount of community funds, if any, that should go towards this project. Um, although we know that there are some site costs here, there's still a lot of things in the air um, that we do like input on, such as the size of an auditorium, whether there's bleachers on a football field, lots and lots of options that we'd like to have resolved so that we can go to referendum. We're confident that the community will support the package we're proposing. I just, uh, for the tech savvy people, there's this, I just call it a little square. What's the technical name for this? A Q, a what? A QR code. So this will lead you to the school website that uh, will give you all kinds of information on the construction, and it is updated regularly. Um, for those of you who don't want to use that barcode, uh, if you go to Sanford.org and click on school construction, you will access that same information. Great. So that concludes our straw poll. Um, what we'd like to do now, for those that can say, we'd like to roll through uh, a brief presentation of where the design stands today. It will include the site design, it will include the exterior building, it will include the interior building. It will also include a day in the life of the student. Now I'm going to roll through this presentation very quickly. Anybody who has to go now, feel free to get up, head out. Um, We'd love it if you stayed because there's a lot of great information here. This information will be posted on those websites, so if you don't have time to stay tonight, you will be able to access it yourself, and we will have future information sessions for everybody. Um, but with that, I'm going to move fairly quickly, and we're going to talk a little bit about exterior design before we go interior. So overall, the site that was just approved on Stock Poll, um, you can see here in the layout of that. What this diagram is showing is all of the state-funded athletic fields, all of the state-funded parking and drop-offs. Everything on this diagram is actually state-funded items. Um, you can see the access off Main Street there. You can see the access off Route 4. Um, and you can see where those areas are lying out. I know there's a question earlier about how much of the land is developable and how much has restrictions on it. You can see the land that has restrictions on it there. Um, it is a nice parcel. It's a great location for both the technical center and for the high school. Overall, looking at the building, um, you, heard, um, you heard the superintendent talk a little bit earlier about the four pathways concept, the fact that there are four schools within schools, each of them with a different character, one of them being science and technology, business marketing and management, one of them, or another being business marketing and management, one of human services, and one of them arts and communication. In addition to that, there's the typical high school stuff, the gym, the auditorium, the core of the building, the place that the community uses the most. Um, you can see that layout here. At this point, this layout is, has been reviewed by the state for a little over a year now, so it's been refined and reviewed and refined and reviewed, but you can see it's a very straightforward, simple building. Um, overall, just in terms of scale, um, your average Walmart would fit over this. Um, this building, although good size for a high school, is not out of scale for Sanford community. Looking at the front entrance, one of our goals for the exterior design was to ensure that the building addressed the community to which it serves, to ensure that it had an eye on Main Street and that it had a clear um, main entrance. That falls within our security plan. Our and a lot of our design um, comes into school security and making sure that people know which door to go to, when they can go to it, and that it's a securable entrance. Um, you can see this entrance here in the center of this building. It is a two-story design, and thus it is a two-story entrance. If you were standing on that um, soccer field or field hockey field, one of the rectangular fields, this is closest to Main Street, or if you walked up from Main Street, this would be your view of that, that entrance. Sizable building, but not out of scale at all. Um, fairly simple, fairly straightforward. Overall, the material palette we've been looking at for a lot of these wings has been um, durable, cost-effective materials. It's appropriate for state-funded projects because state-funded projects are still taxpayer-funded projects. So we're looking at materials that are cost-effective and that are locally available. One of these materials that we've used pretty heavily is a concrete block that is available right here in this community. A lot of the other materials are available in and around this area, um, part of being not only environmentally friendly but also being cost-effective and um, when it comes to shipping and also wanting to give as much of the dollars from this project back to the community as possible has been to make an effort to specify local main materials. Um, at the same time, 
We've been looking for very durable, low-maintenance materials. We know that every district doesn't have a huge maintenance budget. Um, we know that whatever we do in this building has to last a very long time because we're likely not going back to the state in the next decade to try and get more money to fix anything or to rebuild anything. And that's been the, our design approach. Let's do something right. Let's do it cost effective. Let's make it durable. But also, let's make sure it's going to stand the test of time from a design standpoint. Overall, we did say that there's the main entrance wants to be prominent, but there are a couple other entrances that are going to be necessary. One of those is an entrance for the career and technical education wing where public needs to be involved as part of their education process. So that's culinary arts and cosmetology where people can actually come from the community and eat, have, have lunch, um, can have, you know, can receive the services of, of cosmetology. And while we wanted that entrance to be prominent so people could get there, we didn't want it to outshadow the primary entrance. Um, one of the state's initiatives is to have one main entrance in every school that they build. Um, at the same time, this is a necessity for an entrance there. Now you can also see that on our material palette, although we're using brick and concrete block, masonry heavy materials, we did take some liberties to say that some of these spaces that make this building special are really the career and technical education spaces. They're the spaces that set Sanford apart. Um, and as part of that, we wanted the exterior design to show that. We wanted people when they drove up to say, that's clearly a career and technical education area. You can see it's got a specialty window layout that's consistent with what the education space needs. It's got a material all its own. You can see the concrete material, which we laid out in a smooth face, kind of stone-like material around that area versus some of the high school areas, which we went with a very traditionalist approach. Um, not atypical for a community like this where we've got very straightforward brick and um, kind of historic proportions on a lot of the buildings. Now, at the same time, as we marched around the building, we wanted to make sure that people could kind of understand what's going on in that building. There's some pretty great spaces I'm going to show you in a minute, um, but from the outside, we wanted to be able to, you know, see that, to see what some of those great spaces are and to want to be in that building. Coming around the building, if you were to park here, if you were a staff, this would be some of your first entrance views. Now you can see the parking is pulled back a little bit as part of a kind of a safety measure, but our main entrance is still prominent. In addition to the main entrance, which the students use every day, we also needed a secondary after hours entrance. To keep the building efficient, we designed the building so that it can be segmented off so that the community could use the auditorium, or the gym or the fitness room without necessarily opening up the math wing or the career and technical education spaces. That way we can segment the building down, shut down mechanical systems and use it more efficiently than what you use this building today. It also helps with our security plan in that we can deem portions of the building open to the public without all portions of the building open to the public. But knowing that we have these large slugs of traffic coming in to use the gym and to use the auditorium, we need an entrance appropriate to that size, both in terms of entrance and egress. This is that entrance. You can also see some of those career and technical education wings, again, calling out specialty spaces within those wings. So this is the human services wing, and those two specialty spaces are firefighting and EMS. Um, great spaces. Right next to them, you have um, the health sciences that, that ties into that same wing. But again, calling them out from the exterior design so we can celebrate those as being unique to Sanford. There's also an early childhood education center. You can see tucked in there a little bit more private entrance but appropriate from a site planning standpoint in that they do have parent parking here so they can drop off those kids. So that's your primary public entrance. Again, very simple, straightforward design, trying to put a little bit of glass at those main entrances, but use those readily available local materials. Overall, if you look at this building, um, these are the gym areas. So there's one larger gym. It's 1,200 um, seats, 1,200 in the bleachers. It's a single competition court or a double practice court. There's also a second gym that's in there as a practice court that has an option right now for, for community funding to add bleachers to it so that the community could make use of that gym other than just for practices. So if they wanted to have a tournament or seventh and eighth grade play there or any of those youth events that they have an area for people to go. Um, but you can see that the cladding for these areas, very much cost-effective approach where that 
if the interior space warranted natural light, we put a window. If it didn't, we didn't put a window. There's essentially no decoration on this building. It is very straightforward in that if the education space deemed deemed a necessity, it was added. Um, it's something the state has heavily endorsed us trying to do throughout our design, and it's something that I think a lot of the community has told us the same thing. We don't want an over-the-top design. We don't want something that's there just to add to an architectural portfolio. Coming around the building, another wing is the arts and communication. Again, there is video production and graphic arts in that wing, and we've called that out again as a technical center space. You can see many of these technical center spaces are larger than your typical high school space. Um, given that there actually is no state standard for many of these spaces, we've drawn up those very specific diagrams, but you can see they're actually Given that they're larger, they're going to bust out of this building a little bit, and it gives us an opportunity to say, okay, here's something again that makes this wing special. Let's showcase it on the exterior. We do have opportunities for, for some outdoor student area in this area. That's the cafeteria right there in the main core. Um, but coming around, this is a science and technology wing. Now, the science and technology wing you can see is heavily CTE spaces. This is a lot of the hands-on learning labs. These are a lot of the spaces that are what we would consider high base spaces. So they're 20 to 24 feet tall. They're the building construction, welding, automotive, kind of hands-on learning, great lab environments. But they really are loud labs as well, so they don't have space above them. We don't necessarily, we want classrooms close, but we don't want classrooms right above a welding shop. Um, essentially that classroom to be useless. So we've been working with the design to satisfy the needs of those education spaces and at the same time working through how we can treat that exterior skin to be efficient and cost effective. Um, you can see that the technical center has a lot of outdoor space that accompanies that. Um, many of these labs, in addition to having overhead doors, have outside space for students to work. So landscaping students have an area where they can work on landscaping projects. Building construction has areas where they can work on outdoor construction projects or areas that they can store materials. Um, but we have a pretty large kind of use area there that is secluded off as part of our security plan so that although there is access all the way around the building, this access would be very limited during the day and actually be gated off. Coming around, if you look at the overall site, you can kind of see how we're laying out on that site. Um, I know that was very brief. I'm going to show you the interior spaces now and then I can come back and answer some questions at the end. So as an architect, I love to do um, exteriors. Exterior designs are a lot of fun, but as a public school designer, I know that the exterior is great and it's for the community. It's something you want to be proud of. But the most important thing for any school is that it functions. It works well, that the spaces work well for what the students are. Because the students see the exterior and they, they react to it the first time they're there, but they're inside the building day in and day out. And those are the most important areas when it comes to a design standpoint. And so with that, I'd like to kind of take you through what would it be like for your student to come to the school? What would their experience be? Um, because that's really what we're designing. What's the experience that they're going to capture, capture here? So this is the overall floor plan today. All the green areas you can see, that's all CTE space. You can see the science and technology pathway, primarily CTE. That's that hands-on learning labs with a physics room and a couple science labs close by to supplement that. You can see the business and management pathway. These are the areas that are running a business in the school. They have the culinary arts and cosmetology. They also have landscape or landscape and horticulture there because it has a tie to the culinary arts or could have those ties. Um, and then you have the high school business as well as the CTE business, both in that pathway. On the human services side, you can see that we have firefighting and EMS next to um, criminal justice on the upper floor and health and humans or human service, health sciences on the lower floor. In the arts and communication wing, you can see the high school arts. This is the music areas, the fine arts, the digital arts, and then you also have supplementing them the CTE arts, which is the CTE digital or CTE graphic arts, as well as video production. Both of those are flanking the auditorium. That's a community-funded effort that we've got designed in right now at about 832 seats. It's something we continue to refine um, and understand what those costs are and what the tax impacts are going to be. But that auditorium is going to want to be in the heart of the building. And as I mentioned earlier, that community entrance will serve the auditorium as well as the athletics. The athletics, as I said, has full locker rooms, team rooms. It has the double-court gym, the full-size competition gym. It has the secondary gym, which is here. 
and it has um, a couple classrooms that are related to health, as well as a multi-purpose room for wrestling and things that don't happen in a basket in a gym, and then a fitness room. All state funded on that end of the building. The only state funded piece here on this wing is the small areas. If you would like an area for bleachers to go in. Upper floor, you can see primarily high school, while the core of the building, essentially we're trying to assemble these four pathways into an efficient way, um, and with the fifth pathway being the community spaces, we're trying to create a kind of a pinwheel to keep a really efficient core. But in that core, you can see everything in green here. Those are student service faculty areas. Those are the areas where students can go to get guidance for special needs, any of that that's right in the core of the building. And then out in each wing, you can see primarily high school in the upper floor with a couple of CTE spaces kind of interspersed there. The big one there is the, the marketing and business is next to high school, high school business out on that business pathway. So if you were to walk in this main entrance, you kind of have a unifying core that cuts down through and it puts everything on display. The big design notion here is it's Main Street. This is where everything, if you walk into the core, everything's on display, where you can see every pathway, where you can see everything the school has to offer right when you walk in, and it's got all your services. If you're walking in here as a high school student, to your right, you would see the principal's office and the main administration. To your left, you would see the CTE's main administration. So again, kind of an equal footing right at the main door there. This is just when you've walked through that door. So there is a secure vestibule sequence that we've worked through with the state. Um, but right when you walk in, this is the scale of the space we're looking at. There are spaces that are open to above to try and connect the two stories together. There are um, necessary egress ways. Remember that there are roughly 1,200 kids at any given point traveling through this core. So it's an appropriately sized intersection. But everything there on display, if you look to your left, you're going to see science and technology, straight down arts and communication, health and human services. This is just past the administration. If you walked another 20 steps, you're right in the middle of the intersection now. Students heading down to science and technology, they'll see that gateway and they'll know that that's their school. I can head into that school. I can go, um, go right to the lab I'd like to if I'm a CTE student. I can go into the cafeteria if, I'm, if, I need to, if, uh, if that's where I'm headed. There even is a subdividable area of the cafeteria that is dedicated for CTE um, that could be dedicated for CTE and there's even business incubators out in that wing. All the support they need for that school to be up and operational all on its own. So the student would be part of that 400 kids that's in that pathway. Um, similarly, I could head back to arts and communication and I would have the similar type environment. A school of about 400, teachers always there, um, kind of one small school within a school. So if you were headed to science and technology, now science and technology pathway, as I said, heavily geared towards CT. This is the automotive, welding, exploration study, residential wiring, precision manufacturing, building trades, pre-engineering and robotics, computer automated drafting and design. I got that one right this time. Um, as well as a couple of the physics labs and chemistry labs and a few classrooms on that upper floor. But there's, there's been a clear gateway to each of these pathways so that we can create that school within a school environment. Um, so we can create a learning community that the students feel at home. Now, a lot of work's gone into the diagrams for each of these spaces, and we have them. If you haven't taken a look at them, we call them room criteria sheets. But what they are is they are diagrams that show everything that happens in all these specialty labs. And it's something we've used um, with the state. Um, and based on that diagram, based on creating safe spaces for students to work that are conducive to what the teachers need to teach your kids, um, we've created these room layouts. Now, all these room layouts are keeping safe standards and clearances, but it's something that we've used with the state to defend the idea that the technical center is growing significantly. A lot of the spaces they have now are simply undersized and outdated. Um, outdated is to be expected on a building of this vintage, but the undersized has been a key talking point with the state in that there just aren't safe clearances. They just aren't the tools the teachers need to do their best. Um, but this is an example of one of those labs. You can see very straightforward. A lot of these are heavy um, um, equipment rich labs. They've got technology integrated, but they've got natural light up high. And again, we're creating designs that are responsive to what the educators told us they need to work well. If you were a student and you went to that lab, you got out of that lab and you said, now I'm going to take a math class and I can do this right in my own wing. You can head upstairs, and this is a typical classroom. Now, the state does have standards on classroom sizes. This is about an 800 square foot classroom. So far, our approach has been that it will be a technology-rich classroom. Um, one of the 
funny things is we're talking a lot these days about technology and what the current technology is, and we're budgeting for technology. But we also know that the school is going to open in 2018, and all the conversations we have today we're going to have to have again and again and again before the school is finally er erected. Our goal is to have a school that has cutting-edge technology but has it in a reasonable manner and treats it as a flexible component. All of our classrooms are designed with technology components today as well as an approach to how are we going to swap that technology out in the future? How are we going to pull new cables? How is the classroom going to adapt? Similarly, all of our education spaces are designed to be as flexible as possible, knowing that curriculum changes every year as well. So a math classroom is also designed ideally for an English classroom, is designed ideally for world language. Again, trying to get supreme flexibility is one thing we've learned as, as school architects is that you've got to create not only what you need today, but be flexible because you don't know what you need in the future. And that's been integrated throughout our design process. Um, you can see how happy the kids are in this space, too. Obviously, they're well-dressed, they're happy. Um, what's not to like there? Another, if you were in that same pathway and you took that math class and you said, now I've got to head down, I'm going to take that physics class, or I'm going to take a chemistry class, this is a chemistry classroom. Properly equipped, um, it's got the proper um, state standards. It is a state standard classroom, and we have some flexibility in how we create that room. But again, flexible classroom space that meets all the needs the educators have brought forth. If you weren't science, into science and technology, you were a student who wasn't into hands-on learning, you liked video, you liked art, you really found your home elsewhere in the building, you might be part of the arts and communication pathway. Out here you have video production and digital design and graphics at the head end. These are the CTE spaces that we want to have on display. Again, something that sets you apart. Um, further down, you'll have all the band areas, you'll have the music areas, the chorus areas, you will have the arts, the fine arts areas all things that are part of your typical high school, and we've clustered those together to kind of create that home base. And right in the center of that is kind of what we call an integration zone, but it's an area that opens, each of these wings is two stories, and we've got an area that opens itself up to each other so that that school can essentially feel like a, a school of its own. If you headed out into this pathway and you got to that integration zone, to your left you see classrooms. Now there are a few classrooms in the building that do have glass going into them where we made a conscious effort consistent with your ed specs to put learning on display where we said you know these are spaces that you know there's some great stuff going on in them so kids should be able to see in there and teachers should be able to see out um, a lot of these you know, a lot of classrooms wanted kind of a distraction free environment but a few of them said we would like to have a little bit of natural light looking right into that corridor to kind of engage the space um, this is that center engagement point. That classroom to your left actually has an operable wall in it, so it can be opened up to a double-sized room. Again, flexibility, 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 um, as well as an opening in the floors so that we can see up to what's going on in the upper floors and pull natural light down. Um, all along, and if you haven't been involved in some of the mechanical and um, green design discussions, we've been looking towards not just maintainable buildings, but also a building that's cost effective to operate. And one of our goals has been to cut our electricity usage drastically back. Right now we are looking at um, LED type fixtures that have full dimmable packs on them that have the ability to dim themselves as natural light comes in. And as those LED fixtures dim, they don't just dim the fixture, but they actually dim and lower the electrical consumption. And with that new technology that's kind of come about in the last several years to becoming affordable to put into schools like this, we have the ability to say, okay, if we provide natural light into some of these areas, the fixture itself, without anybody doing anything, will start to dim, will start to cut the electrical usage. So now we can finally start justifying where we put natural light and thinking about why we're putting it there. It's not just for aesthetics, it's also for energy consumption and to create great environments. If you were to duck into a TV studio, you'd see a space like this. Now some of these spaces, many of these spaces, exist today in the career and technical education. They're great spaces now, they're going to be much better spaces in the future. Um, the teachers do a lot with what they have here, but these spaces that we're talking about are heavily equipped with the latest technology. We do have specific consultants on board for spaces like this that deal just with how is the teacher going to teach um, a, a trade which changes on a yearly basis, almost a monthly basis. Um, but So these are some great spaces that are going to be in the building. 
you're out in the chorus area. Um, this is the band room scale of space you're seeing there. Um, if you look at the design, it actually sticks out of the building so we can get a little bit higher height, um, lots of acoustic treatment, although a, a state standard size room, an adequate room for what we need. If you were a student that was a human services pathway as in you, you really found your interest in early childhood education, health occupations, EMS, firefighting, or criminal justice, this would be your pathway. Again, you can see those areas clustered together along that one side with some of the high school spaces integrated in that said we really see ourselves as being connected to them. So, for example, Family and Consumer Sciences teaches a section on early childhood education and they said if you place us close to early childhood education, we think our students would be able to see a growing interest in that field. They'd have a little bit of more connection to that technical center and so that integration happened. If you were to go into the health occupations room, many of your CTE spaces are designed around not education environments, but professional environments. So there are some great professional environments here. This, actually our firm has a healthcare design group. They've been working with us on how they would lay out a nursing suite. Um, so we've been working on what is the best space for education, but also looking towards these are, the, these are the spaces that are geared towards students that are going to be leaving high school very soon and might be heading right into this field and trying to get them some of that, um, some of that great experience here. And finally, if you're in business and management, so you had an, if your student was really interested in culinary arts, cosmetology, running their own business, marketing, business services, information technology, or horticulture, this would be the pathway for them. You can see they do have their own entrance in addition to that headway. Um, they also have high school labs and family and consumer sciences, again, integrates into this pathway um, and has some classrooms at that head end as well. So some of those spaces, they're a little hard to photograph, a little hard to render, but you can see very much real world hands-on spaces that we're creating so students are getting some great education here. They're gonna have classrooms that are state of the art, that they're gonna see is the same environment in the school that they're going to see in the field when they go out there or they're going to see in college. Um, but some great spaces in here. This is the um, culinary arts kitchen, a space like this, very heavily commercial. Um, some of the spaces are also, as I said, they're shared use. So one of the areas is business services. So out in the business area, there are two business classrooms and they both said they need access to a conference room. It's one of those areas we worked through with the state and said, well, if they're gonna have each access a conference room, we consolidated that into one conference room, placed it between the labs and said, let's create a real business conference room that students could use so they can do those, um, so they can do their education there. And it becomes an asset to not just the CTE, but also to the high school. Now, if you were headed just for the core, as a community member, if you came into this building in the core and you wanted to see what you're going to see on a daily basis, there's some really great spaces here. If you were just outside the auditorium, if you were in kind of just past the intersection, standing right in the core, there's a large area as an open step presentation area. It's fully equipped so that if students wanted to do a presentation but they didn't want to step into an 800 seat auditorium, they wanted to grab a hundred people or fifty people or the community wanted to do a presentation they really were gearing it more towards fifty to a hundred people presentation like this tonight we've got an area in the core of the building for that that area also serves a dual purpose in that it's open to the dining area for the students it is a heavily used student area during the day and it's heavily and it's well equipped for use of the community after at night you can see there Big scale spaces give us the opportunity to start doing some branding and thinking about what does the interior design want to be? What do students want to see on a daily basis? What kind of environments do we want to create that everybody's comfortable in, that everybody can kind of make their own? If you were to step into that auditorium, which you can see the entrances, two of the entrances, of those auditorium there. If you were to step into that auditorium, this is what you'd see. There's 832 seats today. Um, state-funded portion is actually just the front row of seats there. FYI, the state-funded portion is a little bit smaller than this room here, um, which is why the core building committee, along with the, the performing arts focus group, has heavily endorsed you've got to do something better than what the state funds for an auditorium. And it's been one of the highlights the state says in many of their projects is that most communities do invest in their auditorium um, because the state has a standard that they don't pay for a full auditorium. Um, but this is one of those spaces. This is a community, heavily community-funded space funded space. Um, well equipped and we've been meeting um, several times with teachers but we've also been meeting with an auditorium um, specialist in understanding the equipment and the performances and the constraints we have with each of the sizes of these spaces. 
if you headed right into the gym, this is a fully funded state space. This is a 1,200-seat gym. You can see it's got one center court in the middle. Bleachers pull back. It's got two courts running in the opposite direction. Again, opportunities for branding, opportunities for us to do as much as we want on the walls um, for branding. One thing worth noting, that floor emblem, this is Spartans. That's a community-funded item. That's one of the things that's in the community-funded piece. The state will pay for striping. The state will pay for the court. They'll pay for the bleachers, the space, but they're not going to pay to write Spartans on the floor. Not a big investment by anybody, but it's something that's going to be part of that referendum. Do you want to have this? Because it seems kind of silly to have a state uh, floor that doesn't say Spartans anywhere. And that is the... 10 mile an hour or 10,000 mile an hour view of what we've got in the building now. We'll stick around. I can answer some questions. I can show you some of the other stuff. Um, please come on up um, and we'll be up here to answer as many questions as you have. I don't know if there's any closing remarks by anybody. Um, David, do you have anything you wanted to add before we leave? I mean, you're going to put me between them going home and everything? Is that how that works? That's right. No, actually, uh, I hope people were impressed because when I look at this, I'm just saying what an opportunity for our community and our kids. And uh, I know the young fellows coming up down the road and young uh, students coming up are just going to have a fantastic uh, school for the future here. So thank you all for coming tonight and definitely come on up if you'd like to talk to, to Lance and folks. Thank you.